Coming out this Sunday on Me on the Vibe for a very special episode, back by popular demand, I'm joined by Fito Della Para of Canned Heat. We're in the dressing room in a second story, and all these girls, I, I don't know if I can say this story because it's <laughs> very messy. Anyway, all these girls are downstairs yelling, Bobby Sherman, Bobby Sherman, oh, Bobby Sherman. Nobody's yelling canned heat, okay? They don't even want to know about us. I mean, we had a hit record, but you know, we're a bunch of filthy hippies there in Alabama. So Henry kind of said, well, you know, they don't want to know about us. Look what I'm going to do. He grabs a piece of paper and puts, I want to <laughs> and he signs it, he signs it, Bobby Sherman. <laughs> Grabs the microphone and tells the people there, you know, these people here want us to play 15 minute shows, but they they can't shove it. We are going to we're gonna play as long as we feel like it because we are the canned heat. And you know, there he goes, you know, like everybody in the audience was terrified. There was all these parents with their children there. Right. Because it was a pop show. It was yeah. a pop show with the nineteen ten fruit company bubblegum bands. Well, of course, after we finished that, the police was waiting for us. We got indicted and arrested, mm -hmm. and uh, and, uh, and we had to go to court a couple wow. of weeks later, and we were banned in the whole state of Oregon. So Joe Bonamassa is friends with Jimmy Vivino, our current singer and guitar player, and uh, they play together in the in cruises and in some gigs sometimes they, they have a, a two guitar thing playing together. You know, we talked to Jimmy and he said, I'm going to invite Joe to play lead guitar on, on the record. Final vinyl. Does this mean you know, it's going to be the last one for Canned Heat? <laughs> So, uh, of course, you know, a lot of uh, Canned Heat fans kind of uh, after the first interview that we did kind of wrote in and wanted to know a little bit more about Alan. So can can you kind of recall what, you know, what he was like kind of away from the stage? You know, maybe when you kind of first met him, um, you know, people were saying that, you know, we didn't really kind of know who he was. I mean, obviously, the song kind of briefly touches on that. Well, you know, if you really want to know more about Alan, you should read my book. <laughs> okay? Because in my book, is uh, I talk a lot about him. And then there is another book that this woman, Rebecca, something uh, made about Alan Wilson, too. That that's mm. all about Alan. Uh uh, I, I've never read her book because I don't I don't care about some of the stuff that she's thinking or saying. But if you know, I mean, I can talk forever about Alan. But as I said, the best the best idea if you really want to know about Alan, read my book and and then you'll know more about how he was as a person. He was a very sensitive, vulnerable person you know maybe he has some mental issues we really don't know mm. at the time you know we were all young and we didn't know much about what was going on we were overwhelmed with a success success that we never expected and it came in and then we had to handle it and Alan was not very good at handling success or handling social occasions and things like that. But he was a very talented musician and a very sensitive person. And uh, that's that's the main thing about Alan. And uh, uh, more details, you will have to just read my book. <laughs> hey, um of course, one of the things that, that kind of does come up a lot is that, you know, he, he would go out and sleep in the woods, you know, so he yeah. was obviously big on, on nature. Well, um, he, he was he was a botanist. He 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 he, he uh, not only he was a genius in music, but he used to carry these big, thick books like that on botany. And he decided to learn the names of every plant and every flower on Earth. 
So he used to go out in the woods. Every time we travel, he will go out and and find nature, you know, and be in touch with nature. <laughs> And sometimes collected leaves and pine cones and flowers, and he will carry them in his suitcase or inside the books and stuff, you know. And uh, of course, that also brought us all kinds of trouble going through customs <laughs> on, the, yes. on the borders because here we are looking the way we used to look, you know, a bunch of <laughs> radical hippies, you know, long hair, beard. And uh, and all of a sudden, you know, the, the customs officers opens Alan Wilson's suitcase and finds all this stuff there. You know, he's wondering what kind of smoking <laughs> are they doing? <laughs> are they smoking this stuff or doing something with it? You know, it was really funny to see Alan having to deal with the customs officers because of his collections of leaves and pine cones and flowers. <laughs> You know, but yeah, that was another thing of Alan. He uh, made it into his a hobby of his mm. to learn the names of every plant and every leaf. And just imagine it's trying lot, to learn the, yeah. the, the names. You know, I mean, that's quite quite a thing, right? <laughs> so anyway, that's another side of Alan's uh, personality. Mm. Um. Didn't you guys at one point? Didn't you try and buy? Didn't you buy him like a van or something? Because he he would sleep on the. F yeah, I, I yeah you obviously you read my book and you read the the, the story of the van because uh, Alan didn't know how to drive, <laughs> and uh, you know we're already in, in our twenties, and you know I remember like Bob Hyde telling him. What do you mean you don't know how to drive? What kind of an American are you that you don't know how to drive? <laughs> And uh, that reminded me that sometimes Alan and Bob were like Laurel and Hardy. You know, mm. it was that kind, of, that kind of relationship, you know, the, the big fat guy and the other guy always messing up and the big fat guy grabbing his hand and slapping him and, and, and doing all kinds of things that really reminded me of Laurel and Hardy, especially on that occasion when Bob Hyde was teaching Alan Wilson how to drive. Mm. It was a very funny thing, very funny. See, the, the two of them, you know, as I said, it reminded me so much of of, of the two greatest comedians of all time, you know. <laughs> um, of course, we did touch on it before that bizarre power cut, but we'll have to go there. Um, final vinyl. Um, does this mean you know, it's going to be the last one for Candy, or are we going to have something else going forward? I really cannot answer that, you know. I, uh, I'm i 78 years old. I've been playing with the band for over 55 years. It is a long adventure and a long tra trajectory. Uh, this album represents the current lineup, and we're very happy with the current lineup. We're doing very good on playing gigs live, etc. And the recording uh, got some very good acceptance and good reviews. So if, if we do real good with this album and we do real good with the band and we all stay alive and healthy, <clears throat> there may be another record coming up. But mm -hmm. I cannot say that for sure. So in the meantime, you should consider the final vinyl what it is. The final vinyl. You never know. We might have a final part two. You never know. <laughs> In the future. You never know. We, we may go, you know, it's like, for example, Eric Clapton has had, what, 10 tours, 10, 10 goodbye tours? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And then he tours again. You know, I mean, that's the whole thing. I've never said that this is going to be my last one, but uh, as I say, you never know. It depends on, on what time has for us. Because yeah. time is very important at this at this stage of our lives. Mm. We need to stay healthy and strong. And, you know, maybe we'll make another record. I don't know. But in the meantime, we're happy with the one we have. We're getting great reviews, as I said. And I hope your, your fans and your audience will uh, go and get the record or the CD and enjoy it. Of course, the uh, one of the singles, uh, So Sad, you know, features Joe Bonamassa. Um, how did that kind of conversation come about? I mean, you know, such a huge uh, blues musician. 
Yes, he's very famous and he's a, a contributor to the blues uh, scene in, in the world worldwide. And that's very good. He's uh, continuing the stuff we started with, you know, many mm -hmm. years ago, trying to make blues music palatable for white audiences. So Joe Bonamassa is friends with Jimmy Vivino, our current singer and guitar player. And uh, they play together in the in cruises and in some gigs sometimes. They, they have a, a two guitar thing playing together. So uh, when we decided to do that song, which is a song we did in 1970, and we decided that the message is the same. The world is in a tangle. And that's what the song talks about. You know, so sad, so sad, the world is in a tangle. And uh, we figured that the situation now times is just as bad or maybe worse, a lot worse probably than it was in 1970. So, and, and so I told, you know, we talked to Jimmy and he said, I'm gonna invite Joe to play lead guitar on, on the record. Mm -hmm. Actually, originally we were going to invite Harvey Mandel, who is the original guitar player on the 1970 version. Mm -hmm. But Harvey has been very sick. He's been suffering from cancer and he has some serious operations. And, uh, and he was not in shape to be able to play the to play the, the lead guitar on the song. So once uh, Harvey uh, could not do it, immediately we thought about it and we said, well, why don't we invite uh, Joe Bonamassa? That would be a great idea. Joe rips on the guitar and it'll be perfect for the song. And it worked out really good. He came in, he did the song probably in one or two takes and, uh, and it came out great. So I'm very happy and I'm grateful to Joe for showing up on our record. Mm. Um, of course, you know, he wasn't the only guest on the album. You do have. Yeah, we had also Dave, uh, Dave Alvin uh, doing mm. the Blind Owl tribute. And uh, it's a song that is uh, very emotional to me. And uh, when he started singing the lyrics with this mid shuffle tempo in between, which is some of our expertise, uh, I was very affected when I had tears in my eyes when he started singing about the sequoia trees and where the blind owl flies. And then he talks about, I want to play the boogie for the big bear and play the blues for the blind owl. And then he also mentions something that to us is very important. He talks about how the odds are always stuck against us, but we're here to play no matter what. So Dave Alvin really captured some of the essence of the can his soul and and put that tribute to Blind Owl on the song Blind Owl, which to me, that song alone is worth the record. Mm -hmm. I think it's an excellent version and uh, it was a second take. He just started playing it, you know, right on the studio and all of a sudden we just fall right in and then we said, okay, let's take it. And we did two takes and that was it. And that kept that freshness about it, you know. It's uh yeah, I'm very happy with it. Hmm. Um I mean you kind of spoke there, you know, of, of kind of overcoming adversity throughout your career. Um what was that kind of I mean, I I've read that, you know, after after Blind Owl passed, you guys had just kind of went and kind of toured again like for pretty much immediately when you when you go into like berlin i mean there's there was, yeah, yeah we, there's we had a gig fun. in berlin yeah we had a gig in berlin the night after alan died wow we really didn't know that he was dead when we were taking the airplane or we were at the airport yeah. in los angeles and uh we were about to jump on the planes and our manager shows up and we we were all wondering where is alan we couldn't find him mm. well he was dying or he was already dead uh, behind Bob Hyde's house in Topanga Canyon in a hill. He used to like to sleep outdoors. And uh, he had a little place where he went up up the hill to sleep there, and that's where he passed away. Mm. The place is still there, and the house has been condemned by the government. And uh, mm. there was some guys that actually did an article on YouTube about the famous house of Topanga Canyon Boulevard. 407 Topanga Canyon Boulevard, that's the address, and the house is still there, and the place where Alan died is still there, is the in the hill behind the house. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, over the years, I mean, of course, you know, you've had to kind of replace and bring in people that can step in. How do you kind of go about that? Because, I mean, it, particularly in that situation, I imagine that that would have had to have been quite a quick decision if you're already going on a tour. Well, that's one thing about the can Heat Band, and I'm, of course, I'm part of all this. Uh, mm. We have continued to play, and we continue to perform regardless of all the adversity and all the tragedies mm. that we suffered. Uh, when Alan died, we we continued the band, and we, you know, hired Joel Scott Hill and then mm. other people, and uh, and and play. We continue. We we did the whole European tour right after Alan died, starting in Berlin the the, the day after he died, and then we did a whole European tour. Uh, at the same situation when Bob passed away in 1982. Mm. Uh, when he passed away, we, uh, Henry and I sat down and thought about it. You know, we were saying, well, I guess this may be the ending of the band. But we had a contract in Australia. We had to play in Australia. And the, uh, the promoter contacted me and said, put a band together. He says, Br- bring a, another front man and, and we will back you. But don't cancel the tour and don't cancel the band. Continue playing. And uh, I listened to him and I have to also respect the fact that we were under contract. You know, we already signed a contract, Mm -hmm. show up in Australia and he already had ticket sales, etc. And that's how Henry and I decided we're going to leave it up to the people. If the people agrees and they like us and they accept us, without our two main guys that died, Mm. then we'll continue playing. If the people doesn't like us and they don't show up or they, you know, criticize us or whatnot, then we'll stop playing. So it happened. We went to Australia and the Australian public were very nice, very uh, receptive, and they liked us. We were selling out almost every show in spite of not having Bob Hyde with us or Alan Wilson. Mm. So we decided, you know, Canned Heat is an American institution, and that's how it should be looked upon, not just as a one person's band on another person's band. It is an institution, and it's be, it belongs to the people as much as it belongs to us. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, how, that's, that's the answer I give to people that say, well, why do we continue playing when we lost our main mains, yeah. I mean, inter, you know, members? And, and that's why, because, well, we love playing the music. We like to perform. And as long as the gigs are there and people accept us as they have, mm. there is no reason why you stop. I'm not going to listen to a few purists out there, a few assholes that... <laughs> It always say that you're okay and here is no longer can't hit without Bob or without Alan. Uh, mm. There is there is a few of them there that what do they know? How do they how dare they try to criticize me or criticize us for wanting to continue this wonderful band? You know, what do they know about being 55 years on the road and about mm. being go through whatever I have gone through? I hate people like that. I hate people that criticize us and put their stupid comments on the internet because they don't know. Mm. I think that, you know, you have a complete right to go and play these songs and and do that. I mean, you're very much part of that history still. And I think that while there's somebody there that is, that's been there since, you know, the beginning, I think, you know, no matter what band it is, that they they've perfectly at liberty to go and do what they wish with that. You know. Well, you know, the main thing is the music. We always love the music, and yeah. uh, and there is no reason why to stop playing the music. And that's why another reason I always say: musicians don't retire; musicians <laughs> just die. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't know if I told you that one before, but this is a famous Firo phrase that I always try to put emphasis on it because I, I I see some of my idols that live into their 70s or their 80s, and then all of a sudden they just die one week. Like, for example, John Lee Hooker. I yeah. was playing with John Lee in his last two years of his life, 
and I was playing with him the week before he died. Uh, yeah. his last gig in Santa Rosa, California. And he was sitting there very weak already, knowing that he was going to die and singing about it. Mm. He was singing that song, Never Get Out of This Blues Alive. And, uh, you know, it was very touching and, and very emotional for me to be playing next to my one of my idols and s listen to him saying goodbye. But as I said, musicians just don't retire. We love what we do so much. Mm. Take it all the way to the grave. No, I, th I think that is something that, you know, it becomes a part of you, doesn't it? You know, you don't want to, like, how can you separate that? I mean, it would be like, when yeah. It becomes, yeah, it becomes so much part of you. Mm. Um, of course, you briefly mentioned uh, earlier on that, um, you know, Joe Bonamassa was kind of influenced in part by by Henry Vestine. Um, what do you feel like, like particularly early on when he came in, what do you feel he kind of brought to the band? I mean, I think that he's perhaps one of these kind of underrated uh, musicians out there. You know, he's not the first Are you talking about people. Henry? You're talking about Henry. Mm. Yeah, well, Henry Vestine, you know, in the beginning, he was considered equal to all the best ones, you know, to, to you know... Robert, I mean, uh, uh, Eric Clapton and, and, mm. and people like that, Jimi Hendrix. Uh, in the beginning, when we were playing and alternating with those bands, with Cream and with Hendrix, and Henry Vestine was considered equal to them, if not better, by some other people. Mm. Unfortunately, Henry's excesses in, in drugs and drinking and smoking and all that kind of... Uh, brought him down and eventually killed him. But mm. Henry lasted a long time. He was a very strong man, very, very powerful and very strong. And uh, he lasted to 1997. And he's the one that used the most amount of drugs and alcohol and everything of anybody in the band or anybody I ever know. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know... <laughs> I mean, I think I think that's the thing that some people they can just take more. I mean, I don't. I, don't know, what's I, mean, I don't know if I can say this on your show, but he used Go to say, I, he used to say, I don't want to get high. I want to get fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> Getting high was not enough for him. <laughs> um, I mean, I. I I had a look at a, a prior interview you did, and there was this amazing story of when you were in Japan, and he'd written this kind of pact. Yes, you know God. about that. Uh, I, how do you know about that? I have oh, it, I I it in my scrapbook. <laughs> it was an amazing thing when the two drunks decided to make a bet. <laughs> See, this is part of the a lot of funny stuff that has happened yeah. in our history. I mean, we're not just tragedy. I mean, there's a lot of funny mm. stuff. Like this time, the two drunks in the uh, Hilton in Okinawa. We were in Okinawa, Japan, yeah. playing for the armed forces, for the American armed forces, right? And uh, and they were two, you know, the two drunks that were there decided to make a bet. Bob was going to lose. 50 pounds in two months, something like that, no. if Henry will stop drinking. And they both signed it. I mean, I have the I have the actual letter. I mean, it's so funny because it's <laughs> the way it's written and everything, you know? I mean, I, I, I can show it to you, but I, I will have to go into my scrapbooks to find it. <laughs> but uh, I don't know if you knew about it, but that was it. That was the deal they made, of course. Mm. Next day, they didn't even remember signing that letter. And they didn't respect the, the deal they made, of <laughs> course. Bob never lost the 50 pounds, and Henry never stopped drinking. So, you know, that was it. But but the deal was there. The deal, uh, I, I have the letter, and it's very funny. Mm. Um <laughs> I, I can I can recall it's like the the handwriting kind of gets worse the further down it goes. Oh yes, of course. Yes. <laughs> I know. How do you recall that? Were you around when I show it to you? Or, or, so, so I was I was looking around on online and because um, I like to try and find some interesting thing. As you say, you know, not everything. It's not all tragedy. Um, I think that there's some wonderful stories out there. So I found it via uh i can't remember the name of the chap that that interviewed you 
Yeah, somebody that came to my house, right? Yes, Someone that he was, was in, in my house, and I and I show them. Yeah, it's, it's it's an English guy too. I think they are from England. Oh. Yes, 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 uh, yes. They've been here twice. Oh, and actually, nice. I actually I sent them to Bob Hyde's house where where Alan died, and they mm. went there and looked at it. I gave him the address, and 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 they went there. I don't recall his name, but yeah, well, I've done two interviews with him. Mm. Is the one that has the show called The Greatest Music of All Time, something like that. Yeah, something. Yeah, I remember this. Um, can you, I mean, looking back, you know, obviously this could be the final one. Um, can you recall kind of a maybe a personal highlight for you? Maybe something, you know, it could be while making an album. It could be uh, a time when you're on the road, like, like we've mentioned there. Is there something that sticks with you from your career is there a standout thing or a funny moment for you where you're like you know what that was that was close well, the, <laughs> that moment of the letter is one of them yes. <laughs> uh, I, I have other stories there of course they are in my book mm. i don't know if we can say them here you know what i mean <laughs> I, I don't want to be pornographic here on this interview, but <laughs> it goes in that direction. I, you know, if you let me do it, I'll I'll tell you a, a, a real let's, funny let's story. Let's go for it because we can always censor if we need to. <laughs> uh, you may have to censor. So anyway, this is a real good one, and it was Henry's idea. Right. So we were playing with Bobby Sherman in in Mobile, Alabama, of all places, mm. and. You know, here we are, you know, the can't hit a blues band, a hardcore, druggies, hippies, marijuana smokers, etc. And we had hit records. So the promoters would book us with all these pop bands. Right. Because they didn't know. I mean, the promoters just say, oh, this band has a top 10 record. You're going to put him there in the show. Yeah. They don't know what, this, what we stand for, you see. We were really not part of that scene, but we became part of the scene because we had hit records. And then all of a sudden we're known as a pop band. So they book us with people like the 1910 Fruit and Gum Company, you know, uh, oh, Bobby Sherman, the one I'm just mentioned. I mean, real yeah. pop bubble gum artists, you know, that, that we didn't relate to at all. So anyway, we're in the dressing room in a second story, and all these girls, I, I don't know if I can say this story because it's very <laughs> nasty. Anyway, all these girls are downstairs yelling, Bobby Sherman, Bobby Sherman, oh, Bobby Sherman. Nobody's yelling, can't heat, okay? They don't even want to know about us. I mean, we had a hit record, but, you know, we're a bunch of filthy hippies there in Alabama. So Henry kind of said, well, you know, they don't want to know about us. Look what I'm going to do. He grabs a piece of paper and puts, I want to call <laughs> And he signs it, he signs it, Bobby Sherman. <laughs> and then he grabs the paper, wraps it up and throws it out the window to the girls that are yelling, Bobby Sherman, Bobby Sherman. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> and then we go, and then we go and sign another one. Free tickets for the ones that give the best head. <laughs> and we sign it, Bobby Sherman again. And we send the paper out the window. We did two or three, you know, real good ones. <laughs> like that. And we signed it, Bobby Sherman. Man. <laughs> We were I laughing so much. The reputation of Bobby I don't Sherman. know what Bobby Sherman thought about that. They <laughs> yes. might have taken, I don't know. But I mean, I thought that was a real good idea of Henry to do that because all the little girls were going, Bobby Sherman, Bobby Sherman. <laughs> and, uh, and we didn't like that, so we had to let them know. <laughs> so that's another, another can't hit story for you. <laughs> It, unbelievable <laughs> i mean it, it must have been interesting like you know you have the lights of bobby sherman there and then all of a sudden the bear turns up and it's like you know you guys are from a different world aren't you you know totally totally different world I, I, you know there is another time where we also they, they booked us with all these pop bands again you know this is mm. a, a late 60s when we had the, the hit records right yeah 
And uh, so, so I say many promoters to them, the 1910 Fruit Gum Company, Bobby Sherman, the the whatever all those bands were, all the pop bands, you know, to them, they was the same. They didn't know, wait a minute, these guys are heavy, heavy blues guys. These are more like Jimi Hendrix and, and other kind of bands, you know? Mm. So so anyway, that's how it happened. Uh, this, th this thing happened in in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon. All of a sudden, we find ourselves again with all these pop bands in this pop show. And all these parents with their little kids, I mean, they are there with a lot of, you know, young kids, N not even not even the audience that were coming to see us in the film or, or in, you know, Woodstock or any of that, you know, this was before Woodstock anyway. So, we are in in Portland, and then they tell us you have to play fifteen minutes. That's all you can play. And then Bob Hyde gets angry. I think he was a little drunk. We don't play fifteen minute shows. We are the candy. We want a boogie. We want to play longer. We're not a fucking you know <laughs> pop band. And he goes on the stage and grabs the microphone and tells the people there. You know, these people here want us to play 15 minute shows, but there they can shove it. We are going to, we're going to play as long as we feel like it because we are the canned heat. And, you know, there he goes, you know, like telling them to fuck off pretty much, you know. <laughs> Everybody in the audience was terrified. There was all these parents with their children there. Right. Because it was a pop show. It was yeah. a pop show with the 1910 Fruit Company bubblegum bands. And there is the canned heat ruining it for everybody. <laughs> and there is the big bear, the big bear height, drunk, <laughs> just, you know, saying all these bad words and, and insulting the promoters and telling them, we are the canned heat, we are not going to play no fucking 15 minute shows. <laughs> What the hell is so? Well, of course, after we finished that, the police was waiting for us. We got indicted and arrested, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and we had to go to court a couple wow. of weeks later. And we were banned in the whole state of Oregon because of what Bob said that night. Wow, the entire state, the entire state banned us. Yes. Wow. And uh, for for some time, of course, later on yeah. we we back. But uh, in this mate in the late sixties, after that horrendous exposure <laughs> of Bob Hyde drunken telling the people to fuck off, you know, uh, uh, that was another story of the canned heat. There you go. Unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I've ever heard of somebody like being banned from a state. I mean, he, he's kind of got all of you in trouble there. I mean, it was only four. What do you mean being banned? When we, when we released our Future Blues album and put the American flag upside down right. as a sign of distress, we were banned again from all right. kinds of stores and all kinds of places. Because oh. remember, in the in the seventies, in the early late sixties, when we released the Future Blues album, mm. which was pretty much an environmental message and a message of the song "So Sad" is in there, and the song "Future Blues" is in there, and the cover of the album shows us in the moon, with the Earth behind, all polluted, mm. and we're putting the flag upside down using the same positions that we that they used in the famous Iwo Jima flag, the famous photo of the Iwo Jima flag put up there in the Pacific during World War II. Hmm. You must remember that famous photo of all the Marines holding yeah, the American yeah. flag. So we did the same thing. It was uh, our manager's idea to hold the flag the same way, the same positions and all that, but with the American flag upside down as a sign of distress mm. because the world was in a tangle. That's the, you know, the title Time of the song, so sad, yeah. and future blues. So after that, we were banned in many places and the record was banned in many of the main distributors. <laughs> the big stores do, do, did not touch it because it had the American flag upside down. You have to remember, 
in the late 60s to be an environmentalist, mm, to care about it. the earth and all that, was considered anti-American, was considered mm. communist. They, well. you know, all this, you know, Greenpeace and all these movements and all this uh, Love the Earth movements and all that came a lot later. We were one mm. of the pioneers on that awareness. Mm. And it cost us a lot of trouble. And as I said, we were banned and a lot of stores didn't touch the record, but the record had the song Let's Work Together in it. And it right, became a hit. Yeah. It became a hit in spite of all the efforts of the system to crush us, you know, and to not uh, allow us to become popular. Mm. Um, of course, looking back on these albums, um, is there a a personal favorite for you or is that like trying to pick a, a favorite kid Did well you, you know I like, I, I like all the albums that we have made uh, some of some of them more than others yeah you know I, I cannot tell you which will be my favorites you know it's, <laughs> it's hard of I course. guess musically musically and and experimentally I think and we were reaching a a state of perfection that was very good mm. on on the last album that features Alan and Bob and the classic lineup with me mm. and Larry and Henry, which that will be the Hallelujah album. Mm. Okay, I will say that probably will be about the best. You know, many people agree with me. Uh, but, you know, then the other albums are great, too. The Boogie with Can't Heat. Yeah. The current album, I think, is, is mm. very nice, too. So it's very hard for me to pick one up you know no no i completely agree i mean i, th I think that um over the years you guys have kind of kept like you, it, they, they all feel like a canned heat album but they have these kind of different iterations these different eras i mean like with final vinyl it feels like canned heat but it's like canned heat of 2024 it's you know, yeah. it's brought up to that's right. today. Well, that, that's, that's the way we want to represent. You know, we we don't want to try to be something that we are not. We've tried yeah. that before already. I mean, uh, in, during the uh, 80s, before, uh, before Bob died, we did a project that is called now In Memory of Bob Hyde. It was uh, pretty much... Uh, the uh, Al Bennett, who owned the record company, and he was the guy that owned Liberty Records in the past, mm. too, with us. <laughs> he called us and said, I don't want you to make a blues record. I want you to make a record mm. that, you know, with the, the songs that I just say, the, the catalog that he owned. He owned the Stocks Vault catalog, and he wanted us to grab songs from there and use this. So we tried to do this song. It was more like of a popular album, a pop album. And it didn't work, you know. That, mm. that that was actually our least favorite album. You cannot prostitute yourself, you know. You have mm. to be who you are. And yeah. uh, and that was the story with Ken here. And I, after that uh, effort, that that was not really our idea. It was the idea of a record, you know, record owner, record producer. Uh, we decided never to do that again, and we decided just to play the music we like. We we are not concerned with having hit records or any of that. We just want to make music that will compel people and, and will affect people somehow and make them feel good. Uh, if it makes us feel good, we figured it will make people feel good. Yeah, yeah. Um, finally... Um of course, you know, this album does have these collaborations in there. Um, so if you, I don't know, if you were going to make another album or if you were going to have another future collaboration, do you, do you have kind of any any people that you think, you know what, that would be really interesting to work with such and such? Is there, uh, This, this is a hard question you're giving me. I cannot answer that because we just finished that album. Now yes, you're well, yes. me, who am I going to invite on the next maybe album? A, maybe a live no, performance, will... somebody to I jam don't... with, perhaps. Oh, we I jam with all kinds of bands all the time. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I play with a lot of uh, blues uh, players. You know, uh, last night I played two hours in a place called The Grape right here in Ventura with R.J. Mm -hmm. Michio and Fred Kaplan and uh, uh, other guys. You know, Hank Van Sickle. You know, uh, they are all great blues players, and and we have a great time playing blues music. You know, so yeah, no, 
I, I jam with all kinds of people here in my place. And uh, whenever I'm not playing with canned heat, I'm playing mm. with other people too. It's, it's always fun, you know, doing just for the love of music. Mm. Of course, you know, you work with, with John Lee Hooker and you, you mentioned uh, you were you were there kind of right near the end. Um, and you, and you, I remember last time you were saying that, you know, he had this thing about he would only do two takes. Is this something that you've applied to all of your albums since then that, you know, we're only going to do? Uh, uh, pretty much we have applied that kind of approach. You know, we did try before to play mm. take over and over again, you know, and try maybe 25 takes of one song. So what we find out is after you try a song over and over again, yeah. it becomes a little more stiff. It loses its freshness. Mm. And after listening to all the takes, let's say you, you, you take 20 takes on one song, let's say, then all of a sudden you find out that the first or second take were the best. Yes. You see, that's what happens. That's what happens recording. Of course, if you know how to play your instrument, and if you know the song and you know what you are doing, mm -hmm. you don't need to play more than one or two takes. You know, it's an exercise in futility. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I say that because many bands, you know, they are trying to reach this perfection. And by trying to reach this perfection, uh, I guess you lose the good by trying to be the perfect. Yeah. You see, and that's why I said, we like that freshness about about a song when we are playing it. We rehearse them maybe once or twice only. You know, we don't like to rehearse over and over and over again. You know, but as I said, if you know how to play your instrument and you know what you are doing, mm. you don't need to sit in the studio and play a hundred takes for one song. I mean, it's, it's, it's useless. So mm. that's that's one of our approaches. And I, I learned that also from John Lee Hooker. John Lee Hooker used to call taking more than two takes stupid shit. <laughs> that's what he used to say. That's a stupid shit. I don't take no more than that, you know? Mm. So he was right. If you know what you're doing, there's no need for being looking at this perfection that really does not exist. Mm. <laughs> I, th I think that is a thing that's kind of we're coming back to that you know there was a while i feel where a lot of bands were looking for that perfection as you say and then it kind of loses its heart you know it loses that soul uh becomes a bit robotic i think if it's too perfect yeah talking about robotic you're talking about current music i mean there's so much of it that is so stiff and robotic and it may get worse now with the ai yes. situation coming in you know uh I don't know what's going to happen to music then, but uh, I always hope and have great, you know, great hopes that uh, younger people will also approach their instruments and approach music the way we did. I think I think you know? it is happening. I mean, I hear more and more now that we're. <laughs> You know, there's people saying, oh, you know, we go when we went into the studio, it was kind of we were all in one room, you know, kind of like back in the day. Um, you know, some people are going, oh, we recorded it to tape. Um, you know, they they seem to like this old, yeah. old yeah. school yeah. kind of process. That is good. And that is good because that is more authentic and that is more more musical in many ways. Mm. Uh I know that not not everybody will do that, and many people will just go for the electronic stuff and the chunka 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 all the time and all that, and take their ecstasy and go there and go crazy with these monotonous beats that don't mean anything and all these sounds that are horrible, you know. But uh, but there there are out there some young people that are looking for it, and people that come to see Ken his shows. I consider a younger person that come to a canned heat show, that's an act of rebelliousness. Mm. Of course, because they are saying that they are not getting what they want from music, from whatever the media is giving them. So they come and see some strange, obscure band from the 60s, you know, that, that still plays the instruments, not computers. Mm. See? 
Uh, that's the whole thing. But, you know, as I said, there is great hope on some of the young people that are still playing with their garage bands and all that mm -hmm. stuff and approaching the same way as we did. There's not that many of them. And people, their audience should always back them and support them and go to their gigs and pay to get in and, uh, and support their live bands because live music is very important. Re remember the pandemic. Remember what happened when we could not have live music. Those three years were hell. Um, well, thank you very much for, for joining me, Fito. Um, of course, you know, for everybody out there that, uh, that uh, wants to hear Final Vinyl, I'm sure they do, um, you can via the, the link in the description below. But of course, you know, we're big vinyl people here. Um, so I, I imagine that there is a vinyl available. I mean, I'd be stunned if there isn't. <laughs> okay, we'll see. We'll see what happens. By the way, our, our vinyl is red, too. Nice. The, 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 the LP yeah, yeah. In, in bright red. And it was mastered in Germany, so they did a very good job mastering, too. The, the sound sounds real good. I'm very mm -hmm. happy with it. I, I thank you for your interest, too. I'm sure we'll do another interview eventually. Of course. Um but yes, uh, I, I encourage everybody out there, you know, grab the vinyl. Always sounds better. I, I don't yeah. know what it is. It's uh, that kind of you, warmth, isn't it? If you don't have a turntable, you can get the CD too, which is okay too. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> it's, it's possible. I mean, you can buy the vinyl and just put it on the wall. I don't know. It's got some nice artwork. <laughs> that's good, yeah. <laughs>